Okay, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started. It's 101. I'm Oakley Weddle. I'm the marketing manager at ProTech Services Group. Thank you so much for joining our webinar. I'm going to turn it over to our CIO and EVP, Chris Bradley. Thanks, Oakley. Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar, Cisco Duo, Securing the Future of Work. My name is Chris Bradley. I'm the CIO and VP of Managing Cloud Solutions here at ProTech. And before we dive into today's topic, I wanted to take a moment to introduce ProTech to those of you who may not already be familiar with us. ProTech Services Group is a technology services firm with 29 years of experience focused on understanding the technology needs of businesses and applying a range of innovative solutions designed to help drive them forward. With a wide range of services and solutions, some of our core areas of expertise include managed services ranging from fully outsourced IT operations to custom services designed to meet specific customer needs, cloud solutions from infrastructure as a service from large public cloud providers such as AWS and Azure to enterprise cloud and a variety of SaaS solutions. Security and solutions, including our managed security stack, utilizing a layered approach to protecting IT and data assets, security assessments, compliance SIM and SOC services, and security awareness training and testing. Carrier and voice services, providing consultative analysis and cost optimization for internet and telecom services, premise-based phone solutions, and cloud-hosted hosted voice and call center solutions. Technology and consulting services, which range from small to large-scale IT projects to consultative engagements in any of our areas of expertise. Talent acquisition, with a full-feature staffing division, we are able to assist with temporary and permanent placement of resources with talents ranging from IT and finance to the executive level. Lastly, ProTech prides itself in being an integral part of the community through its ProTech Cares initiatives, supporting organizations like the Boys and Girls Clubs of Memphis, Streets Ministries, St. Jude, and the National Civil Rights Museum, to name a few. It's within our core values to be a true technology partner and help organizations leverage technology to achieve profitability, growth, and security. Today, we're excited to have Cisco technology consultant, Kevin Switzer with us to discuss Cisco Duo and securing the future of work. Kevin? All right, thank you very much. And uh, as mentioned by Chris, my name is Kevin Switzer, technology consultant with Cisco, and been working with various Cisco solutions for the past uh, a little over 14 years now, and uh, started out with the mostly a collaboration data center. And uh, at that time, uh, security wasn't really considered a full, uh, full architecture by Cisco. And about seven or eight years ago, when Cisco acquired uh, SourceFire and introduced Firepower and, and various other acquisitions, uh, Cisco really went all in on uh, on security, uh, so I switched into a role that's been entirely focused on security for uh, about the last seven or eight years. And also with me, I have a teammate with me, Tom Mann. Tom, would like to introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks a lot, Kevin. I'm an engineer covering Cisco security out of our business transformation center, and I have uh, over 30 years of IT experience, actually. So I've been around for a while doing a variety of different things, uh, covering Microsoft for years and then switched over to Cisco about seven or eight years ago and uh, have, uh, dove heavy in uh, the engineering side and technology side of Cisco security. All right, thanks, Tom. And oops, went, went too far. And uh, what we're focusing on today, a combination, we're going to first do a little bit of an overview of zero trust and also general cybersecurity that we're seeing and uh, really with a focus on a duo by Cisco. And uh, as a technology consultant focused on Cisco security, uh, kind of another hat that I wear is that I'm focused on uh, cybersecurity in general, and it's very important that we kind of keep track of what's going on out there. Uh, so I go through a lot of uh, different reports, attend a lot of different seminars that are outside, even outside of Cisco, just to understand what is going out there in the cyber world. And wanted to give you just a, a few pieces of uh, information, a brief reader's digest of what we were seeing out there. And uh, it's very clear that uh, ransomware uh, has gone back to and will continue to be the number one threat. For about a year and a half, we saw it actually drop down uh, pre-COVID down to the second or third uh, worst uh, threat we would see, but that's becoming very clear. It's making a very strong comeback. In 2020, uh, we saw a total of $20 billion in damages. And that includes the actual ransomware payments and then also all of the costs associated with remediating uh, the actual ransomware attacks. And to give you an idea of where we're at, uh, at least as of June, so 
In 2020, there were a total of 1,100 and change ransomware attacks, which led to that $20 billion. As of June 1st of this year, we saw 1,097 ransomware attacks. And these stats come from what has been reported uh, to the FBI. We only can imagine how many uh, were not actually reported, but those are the numbers we have to go with. So we've almost hit 100% of last year's by June 1st of this year, and it continues to go on. Uh, for patch management, uh, the industry is saying that this will become a top priority for everybody. I'm saying that it, it, if it's not, it definitely uh, should be. Out of all the different reports that, uh, that I read, I've seen anywhere from 60% uh, up to 87% uh, of breaches were due to unpatched vulnerabilities. So these were actual CVEs uh, that we knew about, threats we knew about, and we had patch fixes in place uh, to prevent these from becoming actual breaches, but they did anyway, and the reason being is simply uh, because that the software had not been properly detected that it was out of date and updated. So it's definitely going to be and should be um, a big fact, a big focus going forward. This is what I would consider kind of the low-hanging fruit. Hey, we know about this. We might as well stay up on top of it and prevent breaches if we can. Also, with uh, a major software manufacturer, and if you happen to be uh, paying attention, uh, Mr. Tom Mann had mentioned he was focused on this vendor for, for quite a while, but don't need to necessarily mention them again, but what they stated uh, not too long ago was that, hey, um, please, uh, stop using SMS and call-based multi-factor authentication. Now, multi-factor authentication um, is considered the gold standard of authentication, but we need really need to be aware that SMS and call-based MFA, uh, these messages are not encrypted. And this does uh, potentially allow for some advanced threat actors to perform what we call a man-in-the-middle type of attack. And just one example is that Attack, these particular attackers used about 20 emulators to mimic about 16,000 phones. And these were all phone numbers of customers of a particular bank. And they were able to access those bank accounts based on these emulations and pull down money from their accounts and cost the bank a total of $10 million in damages. And they had MFA set up. Uh, it was in SMS and, and call base, but uh, these men in the middle were able to circumvent that. Uh, we must focus on a more secure way of MFA, which is going to be app-based MFA. Now, we had already been seeing a shift in IT landscape over the last uh, several years, more and more uh, remote workers, more and more personal and mobile devices. Obviously, with all the things COVID, that even uh, escalated the shift uh, much faster. So we're seeing, still seeing to this day, a high number of remote users, more and more personal devices, and people who now have, you know, and they're new to it, having remote access saying, well, geez, you know, I have this old tablet over here. Uh, I kind of like to uh, use that as a better form factor for, I don't know, sitting on the couch and working. So we're seeing a lot of other types of devices uh, attempting to connect to a network. And of course, a uh, big shift to uh, cloud and, and hybrid infrastructure. So some internal systems and some external uh, infrastructure as well as applications. So absolutely seeing an evolving perimeter, and as far as we can tell, it's going to be uh, ever-changing uh, going forward. And we want to focus on a zero-trust uh, approach, and through the stats that really make us believe this is that 81% uh, of breaches involve compromised credentials. So when you look at the actual attack chain and the way things work on the attacker end, is that there's, there's actually different groups of expertise uh, of these attackers. So there's typically a group who is simply trying to gain your credentials, and this is going to be through social engineering. Uh, lately, the highest percentage is through spear phishing, getting people to click, going to a website that looks like something they're familiar with, entering credentials. Uh, the next step is that they're at, once they have those credentials, they're going to sell them on the dark web uh, to the folks who are really the experts in malware and ransomware and eventually turn it into that type of attack. So also 54% uh, targeting specific uh, web app vulnerabilities that have public exploit available. And again, that leads back to uh, simply patching devices. And since pandemic started, we have seen, uh, and I've seen a couple of stats on this, anywhere between 300% and 350% increase in specifically targeting uh, devices. The attackers know about this shift to work remotely 
and and how it, at least at first it really wasn't a proper focus uh, to secure those devices. At first, everyone was like, okay, I have to continue business. Let's get all of our employees set up to remote workly, and we'll worry about security uh, as a second thought uh, down the line. So the attackers obviously knew this and tried to take full advantage of that. So they are targeting devices that are connecting to the network remotely that are not secured. So in a traditional approach, network control approach, uh, there was one, basically one path of authentication for remote user to access the network. And that allowed uh, the attackers, once they were in, to access pretty much anything on the network into the, the crown jewels, if you will. Uh, we didn't extend the security to new perimeter cloud mobile and hybrid environment. Now with a zero trust environment, the best way I can describe this is trust nothing and verify everything. We wanna make sure we secure access to applications and et cetera. And just to dive deep, a little bit deeper into this. And if we were really going deep into zero trust, we could easily spend two hours on this, but just to kind of give you the, the gist of how we start approaching this. Uh, we start out by determining uh, what we are really trying to protect. And what we refer to this in the zero trust world uh, is what is our most critical and valuable data, assets, applications, and services. And in, in this world, we refer to that as DAD. So again, the data, assets, applications, and services. And we want to determine uh, for each individual uh, company or organization, uh, what is our most critical data? Um, this could be customer data, finance data, uh, payment data, patient data, or uh, payment uh, card industry, anything that happens to be regulated. Also, uh, what, are our, what are our assets, uh, IoT devices? Um, Scott refers to supervisory control and data acquisition, uh, also point of sales devices uh, that might not be workstations necessarily. Um, our applications, any software we're using for business purposes, either it's off the shelf or uh, in-house built, what type of services do we really need to uh, protect that are easily exploitable? Uh, for example, DNS. We all probably saw what happened with Facebook recently when that service uh, was not protected properly. And as far as we know, it was an internal error that took the whole thing down. And for each of these things that we identify that we really want to protect, we're going to create a micro perimeter uh, for each of these. And the access to all of the corporate resources uh, should be determined by dynamic policies, and they should be enforced on a per session basis. So even if I logged in uh, three hours ago and I broke that connection, I try to log in and access again, I should be uh, authenticated again. And it also should be updated based on the current state of the client ID or the application service and request asset device. Uh, so it's not a simple, let's, okay, they were verified. We wanna keep checking that as well. All communications to the resources uh, must be authenticated, authorized, and preferably encrypted if all possible. And we should uh, keep the authentication and authorization systems agnostic or separate from the underlying network. And the system should monitor and measure the integrity of security posture of all owned asset associated assets. So again, let's keep an eye on uh, any changes that may happen and if they would create a vulnerability. And the components that typically make up uh, a zero trust system, it's gonna be identity and access management, multi-factor authentication, which is what we're really here to talk about today. Also, that includes device health, um, as well as network access control. And we should set up access control and micro segmentation. So some type of rights management. Uh, yes, I'm an employee. What type of employee am I? What rights to which services and applications that I have? Obviously, it should include some type of uh, firewall, as well as a VPN construct to connect to that. And also monitoring that user to see if they're actually attempting to do something they shouldn't. Now with Cisco Secure Zero Trust, we wanna provide a comprehensive approach to securing all access across your network applications and environment. Um, and just so you are aware, we're here to talk about this, uh, this first topic, Zero Trust for Workforce, Cisco Secure Access uh, by Duo. And just so you know, uh, Duo was a standalone company and that was acquired about three years ago uh, by Cisco and it's simply renamed uh, Cisco Secure Access by Duo. Cisco recently 
uh, change names of many of their security solutions. So I'll try to use uh, uh, the previous name as well as the current name, just so you're aware of it. But we went from Duo to Cisco Secure Access by Duo, not a big deal there. And just so you are aware for the full Cisco Zero Trust, there are some solutions that are out of scope uh, for this particular session. Um, but a couple of the products we could talk about if you're really interested down the line, the Cisco Secure Workload, as well as um, a few of uh, the SD Access solutions we have as well. Now, the first thing we wanna do is uh, verify user trust with MFA. And with Cisco Duo, it's actually uh, quite uh, simple and convenient. Um, you install an app on the user's device, uh, through their login on the laptop, they're able to uh, do a push and do a simple verify. And what I particularly like about it the most is that um, I don't have to receive a text or, or phone call from a convenience standpoint and then re-enter it in. It's simply going to come to my device. In my case, it is an iPhone. And uh, it's going to basically ask me to accept the request. If I haven't requested, it's pretty easy to hit the red button. And deny, and also it's going to fully integrate with the biometrics on my particular iPhone. Uh, in my case, it is my face scan or thumbprint or, or whatever that may be. Just a few easy steps, and it's simply going to ask, what type of device um, are you actually trying to connect with this? And there's a lot of different uh, devices that are compatible uh, with Cisco Duo. So, of course, wearable. So if you happen to have an Apple Watch, it can fully integrate with that. Sure, you can do a phone call, uh, but we prefer not to. You can do biometrics, like I mentioned, so a thumbprint or a face scan. And also, just like uh, RSA, a Duo does have tokens available and also can integrate with third-party tokens if that is a, a preference or a requirement. Most often, we're going to do a push. So it's going to do a push request to the device, and I simply unlock my device and hit accept or deny. And of course, we can do soft tokens, UTF, and SMS if you really want to. And again, we're really trying to get away from those phone calls and those SMS uh, ways of doing things because these other ways are much more secure. Now, one of the other uh, issues we run into is uh, a compromised device uh, <coughs> for various reasons uh, can, can really cause trouble for the entire system. And one of the problems is admins just don't have the time to patch all devices. Also, a lot of uh, users are trying to connect out-of-date devices, different devices, unapproved devices, and things like that. And also, a lot of users don't want the admins to take control of their personal devices. So it's kind of a, a circular problem we have with that. So, of course, with Duo, uh, what we are going to do and should do is assess the health uh, of the actual device and also the security of it. So when we do an initial assess security posture, uh, what we're going to ask it, and these are policies you have the ability to set up and change uh, should, you, should you wish to. So we're gonna double check if we require a management application on there. Is that on and is it running? Uh, are we running up-to-date software? So is the actual operating system uh, up-to-date or at least close enough to it? Is the device encrypted if we require that? Do we have some type of passcode or PIN on the device if we require that? Do we have a firewall running on it and is the biometric enabled or disabled? So we also have the option based on uh, the policies that we set up. Uh, we can say, for example, if uh, on an iPhone or a device, a new operating system was released uh, just a couple of days ago, and depending on the severity of that update, we can say, okay, um, it's only been a couple of days, so we'll give you five more days to update that and, and send a push notice about that. So you're allowed in this time, but FYI, you only have a few more days before you uh, have to do that or else we will deny you. Um, and same thing with all these other different policies. Uh, so we can say, hey, you actually have jailbroken your phone. We are not going to allow you to connect or your biometric is disabled. We're simply not going to allow you uh, to connect. So with the overall system of Duo, uh, two things we want to provide to you is complete visibility. So what is actually going on with the laptops, small devices, uh, using native uh, vis device visibility. Assess the security posture, so easily identify secure security posture if they are managed or not based on the enrollment of the MDMs, EMMs, and continuous inspection. So 
Uh, when it comes to MFA and zero trust, uh, this is not a box solution. Uh, this is a journey and it's gonna be evolving and ever changing. Uh, so we also wanna continuously monitor that device and see if anything has happened. So for example, if malware has found its way onto this device, we wanna be aware of that and be able to uh, prevent that connection. One way we can do that is with Cisco Secure Endpoint, which is formerly known as AMP. Come on. So one way we can do a continuous inspection is integrating Duo with Cisco Secure Endpoint, which would be also running on that device. So let's say we have the user and their devices uh, connected to an application. We also have Secure Endpoint running on that device. Now, Cisco Secure Endpoint uh, detects malware has been connected or has been loaded onto this device. AMP can notify uh, the duo to say, hey, there is malware on this device. You really need to block it at this time. And of course, uh, what we're here to do is to uh, provide secure connectivity to just about any application that we want to connect. So uh, proprietary apps, Microsoft environment, it has automatic uh, APIs and hooks into those. Various cloud services, even Unix, though so Red Hat, Ubuntu is, is compatible. Um, any type of uh, VPN, cloud applications, web applications, et cetera. And of course, since uh, Cisco has AnyConnect, which is a secure VPN now, um, it has very easy integration uh, to authenticate for that solution as well. Another uh, very key feature um, is the analytics engine. And what this does is it actually evaluates historical and contextual patterns. So if, for example, this person utilizes Duo Push 97% uh, percent of the time, and then all of a sudden they decide uh, they're gonna use an SMS password, that's something we should uh, potentially be concerned about. And this is where Duo Trust Monitor uh, comes in, it then it's gonna send an alert and say, hey, look, this is very odd for this user and here's exactly why, here's the statistics. And based on the policy, um, it's either gonna allow, block that, or just send a notification. And just so uh, you are aware, there are three flavors uh, to Cisco Duo, uh, and these are different licensing levels. So under MFA, you're gonna get multi-factor authentication, single sign-on, protecting the application, and also it does include uh, the FedRAMP version of this, should there be federal requirements for a customer. And dual access, it's gonna give you some additional capabilities, so adaptive group space policy controls, user-based policy controls, and this is also where those uh, device visibility and health checks that I mentioned uh, come into play. And the top tier is gonna be dual beyond, so MFA access plus, third-party agent verifications, trusted endpoints, and that secure remote access, which ties into Cisco Secure Endpoint uh, that I had mentioned. So just so you're aware, three tiers of licensing based on the actual features and your needs. And with that, I would like to turn uh, the presentation over to uh, Tom Mann to provide you with uh, a live demo of Duo. All right, thanks a lot, Kevin. Let me uh, share my screen here. So what we're gonna look at here on the demo both the kind of the end user side and then also from an administrative side or administrator side, what you would see. So to show uh, end user demos, they actually have a real quick and easy place, duo.com slash demos. I just scroll down and I can walk through real quick end user demos. Uh, so there's some here. So at the bottom, they actually even have some you could try yourself that you could actually use your actual phone and actually log in to some uh, dummy applications that actually exist. Uh, that would be installing the actual app and everything. So that's so people could try all these different applications uh, with their actual phone and really authenticate, uh, you know, including, you know, it's not just Cisco VPN, uh, wide variety of applications. Uh, these are just some demos they have. They support many more applications. So if we just go through a couple of these first, uh, then we'll go look at the administrative side of things and some of the visibility reporting and things you get. This is super basic demo, just showing someone logging into Outlook uh, web app here. 
Uh, and then they get the options to authenticate. So this one's set up where they could do a push or they could do a UTF, like a UB key. That would be a USB stick in the side of their laptop or computer with a button on it. And that would be your second factor. You hit the button. Um, the most of the two most secure re recommended ways is either dual push with an app or the UB key or uh, UTF. Uh, so actually, if I hit that, I could uh, hit log in here and do approve. And it's as simple as that. And then they get in. And now they're into their email, as you can see. Uh, we'll just show one more of these and then we'll take a look at the administrative side. Um, you know, and uh, talk about the solution a little more. So, uh, here we go. We're back to this page. So, uh, here's uh, other examples. Uh, you know, you have self remediation is another option. So, in this case, I'm going to click on it and it's going to come up. And basically, it's going to have a, a login to Office 365 online here. Uh, so I put in the username, put in the password, and basically it's opening the dual health app. That's an optional component that's available for Windows and Mac, which will show the health of the particular device. It's a real small little applet that you can put on there. Uh, if I click that, uh, it's remediating the fact that their firewall was not, and it explains how they actually could do that and make that happen. Uh, you know, so that way they can enable it uh, because you don't want them to log in if their firewall is actually turned off. Yeah, so that's uh, two quick little options. Uh, here's even a link why or how I could turn it off, things like that. Here it actually steps through it. It's a prompting for the local authentication to turn it on and then they're turning on the firewall. Uh, and in this case, they're refreshing the browser and it's actually gonna check again, passes this time. And now I could do that dual push uh, and get approved and I'll walk it in and can get to all my web-based applications here in Microsoft 365. Um, you know, so that's showing a few of the features uh, as the users try to log in. Now, if I switch over to here, this is actually the administrative council, the cloud-based dashboard, uh, basically. And right now I'm actually on the dashboard view and I get a view of everything going on from an authentication standpoint as users log into my environment. I can tell if they have out of date browsers, if some are locked out, some are inactive. This is showing authentications throughout the day and over time. So you can see there's a trend during work hours that's going to go up. Uh, you can see there's any spikes. Just on the dashboard here, you can see a uh, quick authentication log. This is just the last 10 logins. I can go to the full log here. But what Duo is showing is there is a lot of visibility. So, for instance, in this case, they logged in with Duo Push, and it shows the device's phone number there. But also, they actually came in via Microsoft RDP. So that was a remote desktop protocol session that got authenticated. Uh, basically, uh, if I scroll down, there's others like this one's a Windows 8.1 machine and it can tell me what browser they're using and the version their firewall encryption was on. Uh, these are valuable things to know uh, because if their machine isn't compliant, doesn't have these settings, it might not be a secure machine. If you can't trust the machine they're coming from, how could you really trust the user? Just because it's a valid user doesn't mean their machine is actually uh, safe. So that's definitely one of the concerns or what we are using Duo to get that additional information. So multi-factor, but more than that, that visibility and enforcement. Uh, if I come down to Device Insight, I could get a deeper view then into uh, on the Device Insight tab, the types of machines coming in, Mac, Windows, Android, iOS, uh, and more information. Or if you could dive deeper, say, into mobile devices, is that you could be browsing from the mobile device, and the mobile device could be an authentication device. So now this is showing all the different versions that people are logging in from. Uh, and is that good or bad? 
uh, because you could go set policies saying anyone older than 12.5 isn't allowed to log in or anyone older than 7.1 or 8.0, whatever you deem your policy so that people don't log in with their Android device they bought eight years ago uh, that's been compromised 10 times over. Um, and this shows if they've tampered the devices, if screen lock, various settings are on on the device. Uh, so that's some of the visibility uh, on a mobile device. You have the same thing with laptops and desktops, Mac and Windows are gonna be the main ones here, showing all the different versions. Say if I wanted to, then I could dive into uh, a little deeper and it shows the actual uh, windows and what browsers they were using and logins. And this would be specifically all uh, Windows uh, 10 devices uh, that it brought up as an example. Uh, now, what you're ultimately doing though with this product is protecting the applications people are trying to log into. That could be VPN. That could be a SaaS service like Microsoft 365 or Salesforce.com. It could be administrative councils. It could be a whole variety of things uh, that you uh, might want to log into. Think about anything a user logs into that has a username and password is a potential thing that could be compromised if someone gets fished and gives up that username and password. Uh, so anywhere they log in, frankly, uh, you should try to do multi-factor authentication if you can. In this example, they're using, all of these are different applications that they set up with multi-factor authentication. You know, so here's Microsoft RDP. They're integrated with ADFS, Active Directory Federation Services. Now that's optional, you don't have to do that. Uh, but there's a lot of different ways all different kinds of applications integrate. SAML is a modern, uh, uh, application most clouds use and uh, this can integrate via SAML here they're integrating into box uh, ultimately there's a primary authentication too and that could be that you integrate with so that could be active directory or azure ad or other idps that are out there uh, so that someone gets their username and password from whatever system they're using we're integrated with that and then we integrate into the application uh, so when you go to actually set this up for any one application, it's real pretty straightforward and easy for any one application. Now, if you're going to be doing 20 applications, you know, then each one you would work on separately and get that going, basically. Um, you know, so that would be a project that would take time then. But these are all pre-built application uh, kind of templates. You know, so there's lots of third parties in here. Uh, but you don't even have to be on the list actually uh, there's generic ones too like generic sample and i've set up some with that so actually if i go back to the top uh, and just type in uh, sample uh, these are no, actually did it do a search that well, maybe it's not going to search for me typical uh, so down here uh, yeah, there should be a generic one for a sample in here somewhere, but not a big deal. Uh, as you can see, uh, there's actually more in here than I even remember, uh, you know, since the last time I've been in here. So they're, you know, continually adding a variety of different applications. They so can protect as many as you want to. So there's also single sign-on. So about a year ago, they started doing a single sign-on uh, cloud of their own so that you could actually uh, go to one spot and see all your applications listed and use this as a single sign-on solution also. It also makes it an easy way to integrate with SAML and Active Directory using that single sign-on. Uh, for example, like you mentioned in SAML, that's, uh, uh, if I'm integrating with Azure AD, that's uh, how it does it. If I integrate with Active Directory, that'd be locally probably with LDAP, but there's different ways that these integrate and different options in the deployment. Um, so uh, one thought is, does anyone have any questions uh, that you'd like asked? Uh, I'd like to ask, you can put those in the chat and I'll check that. It looks like there is something in there now. Uh, Tom, um, we have a, a request from Tom. 
uh, will we be able to see how Duo would work to two-factor a Windows domain login? Sure. Uh, well, I'm not sure I could uh, necessarily demonstrate it. Let me see. Uh, the way it works um, is uh, on your domain controllers, um, you know, a little piece uh, you push out with group policy to all the Windows machines, if you're going to do the actual Active Directory domain for Windows logon, and you update a little piece on the domain controller so that when users log in, uh, they actually get that two factor as they're logging into their Windows box. Uh, so that adds a lot of security uh, when you're doing that. And that could also be used with RDP. Um, so I believe there was one here. Let me, here it is right here. So basically, if dual for Windows logon, you know, here they're showing them at their PC. Uh, they put in the username and password, the little thing here. And it'll pop up a prompt for how you want to authenticate. And this is set by policy, too. You could have, you don't have to have call if you don't want that as an option. Uh, passcodes is a little number that would be in the app. One advantage of passcodes is that could be used offline. So if you have no internet access, you could still use passcode. And passcode's much better than SMS. SMS would be one of the weaker methods. I'm going to do push and say I'm online and go right in here and basically that's it now i'm logged into the windows pc but that does require a little piece of code to be added to the pcs and the domain controllers for that to actually happen uh, but you can push that out a variety of ways uh, good question um, any other questions Yeah, so one note too, if you're thinking of uh, domain lock-on or if you're thinking of RDP, because uh, that's a popular one I get is people want to do a remote desktop protocol. Uh, you choose basically when you set it up. If you're going to do just RDP, you do RDP. And then anytime people remote, use a remote desktop client into a PC, they'll get the two-factor, but they won't if they log in locally. Or you can enable both, and then you always get that uh, additional prompt. Uh, you could also have users uh, be exempted too, uh, for example. Uh, you know, if you have a pool of users that you don't want that to happen, you give them a different policy where it would bypass Duo, basically, uh, for that particular user. Because notice you're logging in uh, first uh, to uh, the machine with the username and password. Someone asked about uh, SonicWall for 2FA. Uh, but do you mean with VPN, I assume, or I would think? Um, so, well, a couple things. Uh, Dual supports LDAP and RADIUS uh, logon and SAML logons. Um, it also supports SSH. You know, they, there's Dual Network Gateway, which is an SSH reverse proxy. Uh, so that can be used with a lot of different products. Uh, if I actually go to documentation, uh, you'll actually see as I scroll down, uh, or you could even type uh, like a sonic uh, comes up right here. Now this might be, this is for remote access and VPN, but notice all the different VPNs. So you're not limited to just Cisco. For remote administration, um, I don't think SonicWall would be a problem to if you wanted to SSH in. Uh, I'm not sure about web browser, but that would have to be individually investigated. Um, the dual network gateway, uh, as I mentioned, uh, that's something that you could set up. Uh, like if I uh, do a search for a network gateway, uh, here's the dual network gateway. That you put on the edge of your network is a reverse proxy for SSH and HTTPS. For quite often, it could be admin use. So you could set it up where you would do an HTTPS to the dual network gateway, and then it would SSH to uh, all the different devices you pre configure, like switches and routers and firewalls that you want to SSH into. Um, you know, so that uh, actually uh, would support probably almost any SSH device. They do have a list in here somewhere, 
but it doesn't have to be on the list for it to actually work. This is the documentation actually uh, for uh, getting the dual network gateway to work. So somewhere in here, they might have some uh, applications uh, that they list, but uh, don't want to digress too deeply. Um, the difference between the free and paid version, the free versions uh, basically going to be similar to the entry level version, dual MFA. Uh, so if I do dual and uh, packages, uh, it should be right here. And basically these are the four versions. The free is limited to 10 users. Uh, but if you notice it's similar to dual MFA, but it, it is minus a few features than the entry level uh, product right here. So this uh, breakdown goes into all the differences. So this is something easy to find, uh, just dual.com slash additions and pricing. Whereas I just uh, found it like that by doing a search on the internet too. Uh, but those are the, the differences between each level right here. All right, other questions? I'd like to come back over to uh, this demo, the other thing uh, to note, if you're actually interested in setting it up, little tidbits is normally because this is a second factor authentication, you create a, a user to match your primary. So if you use an active directory, whatever user they have there, you would match here. And you could import them, you could do replication. There's a whole variety of different options uh, to get that going. There's even self uh, user creation by the users. You could set them up for that. Um, so question on devices. Um, it is, a, I believe, a per user device. Uh, we, that per, per, per user license, if anyone wants to double check me on that, it doesn't matter. No, no, I'm pretty positive. Uh, it's you're not limited to a particular number of devices. It's just based on you have a user and you're authenticating from different devices. Um, yep. Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah, good question, though. Kevin, any thoughts on anything else? I am double checking uh, the one to many objects limit on dual for you right now. Yeah, um, so there are limits. There are actually limits, but I think you're going to like them. Um, per user, uh, 100 phones, 100 groups, 100 tokens, et cetera. So it's, uh, there is a limit, but uh, they're, they're pretty uh, lenient. And I'll yeah. drop a, a link with that, at, with that answer into the, the chat. Yeah, I knew there wasn't some limit like five or three or anything like that. Uh, it's kind of a limit, more of an administrative limit limit to the software almost. Like they don't want someone connecting thousands of devices, one user. Um, if I go into a particular user, you could actually see, you know, uh, how they're configured, uh, their previous login. So this is the logins for this user and the machines they logged in from. Uh, you can even tell what country they're logging in from and you could set policies in Duo to block countries. Like if you just want the United States, uh, you could do that, uh, and they could only log in if they're coming from the US IP address, uh, things like that. So a lot of things you could do. Here's one, someone was logging in from South Korea. Uh, now, that in itself isn't a big deal. Uh, they're uh, an, an ally of ours, uh, of the US, but uh, if you don't have any business in South Korea, that might be a big deal. Uh, you might not want that, so it depends. Um, Yep, so I guess we could uh, end uh, the demo here, um, not a bad spot, and uh, finish with any final questions, or we could uh, bring up the slides, and let me do that right now. We'll bring up the ending slides, and we'll finish off here. So I'll hand it back over to ProTech. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for coming. Um, for our giveaway this webinar, we are giving away a Series 6 Apple Watch. 
if you'd like to participate in that uh, giveaway, please, if you have, do not have your full name as your username on WebEx, if, uh, you know, if your uh, username just says your first name, please uh, respond to me privately in the chat box as we need that for the giveaway to see who attended. Otherwise, thank you so much. If you'd like to know more about ProTech, please visit www.psgi.com. And here's that closing slide with that information. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining us today for our presentation. If we were unable to get to your question or you have any other questions concerning this topic or any other topic that we can help with, please feel free to reach out to us at the contact information on the screen. We hope you found this information beneficial and we hope to see you again on our next webinar. Thanks so much and have a great rest of your day.